If I were to ask you the relevance of saddlers, girdlers and pewterers to the modern city of London, would you have any idea what I'm talking about? Well, stay with me and let's find out. In 1929, my mother was born in this street in London's East End. These days, the houses are owned by a housing cooperative who are currently giving them a lick of paint. In old age, my mother could still remember, as an 11-year-old, standing petrified in this street on the 7th of September, 1940. That day, on the first day of the Blitz, and in broad daylight, a great wave of enemy bombers flew overhead on their way to bomb the nearby docks. My mother's family were never affluent enough to own their own home. Instead, they rented the house from the Worshipful Company of Mercers, who owned most of the houses around here. The Mercers were, and still are, the leading livery company in the City of London. Most of us rarely hear about livery companies, but for hundreds of years they have played an important part in the life of London, and often far beyond. The saddlers, girdlers and pewterers I mentioned earlier are all livery companies. But what exactly is a livery company? I went to the City of London to find out. This is Smithfield, where many of London's great historical events have taken place. In the past, it was located immediately outside the ancient city wall, but remained within the jurisdiction of the City of London. Throughout the Middle Ages, its buildings surrounded an open piece of land, and the name is an adaption of Smooth Field. By the 12th century, it was used for sporting events, and also the Bartholomew Fair, which was one of the highlights of London's annual calendar. More gruesomely, it was where many executions took place, such as that of the Scottish independence leader William Wallace, immortalised in the film Braveheart. Here is a memorial to him. Many people were executed here for refusing to follow the official religious dogma of their time, either Catholic or Protestant. Near to Wallace's memorial is another to several Protestants who were burnt at the stake here in the 16th century during the reign of Queen Bloody Mary. Bartholomew Fair was named after the adjacent Priory of St Bartholomew. St Bartholomew's was originally founded as a monastery in the reign of King Henry I in the early 12th century by a canon of St Paul's Cathedral, whose tomb you can see here in the church, and it grew into one of London's main hospitals. When Henry VIII closed all the monasteries in England, the Priory's church continued as a place of worship, and St Bartholomew the Great remains as one of the oldest and most atmospheric churches in London. Henry allowed the Priory's Hospital to continue, and Bart's is now the oldest working hospital in the country, and one of the leading medical institutions in London. Here is a statue of Henry VIII, the king who dissolved the monastery, above one of the entrances into the hospital. Over the centuries, Smithfield became a major livestock market, to which cattle and other animals were herded from the surrounding countryside, to be sold before their slaughter to feed London's population. The animals are no longer herded here, but Smithfield remains London's main meat market. There are some great pubs in this area. Two of my favourites are The Hand and Shears and The Fox and Anchor. The Hand and Shears can trace its history back to the 16th century, and it was from where the Lord Mayor officially opened Bartholomew Fair each year. There has been a Fox and Anchor pub on the same site for over 200 years. The current building dates from the late 19th century, and the tiling on the façade was produced by the famous Dalton Pottery at Lambeth in South London. If you crave an early morning beverage, you might like to know it opens at 7 o'clock on weekday mornings to cater for the night workers of the meat market. But for now, I have no time for that. I'm here at Smithfield to visit Haberdashers Hall, the home of the Worshipful Company of Haberdashers, one of London's great and ancient livery companies. It's here that I'm going to find out how livery companies came about, what a livery company does today, and also take a look around Haberdashers Hall. An important date in the calendar of all livery companies is the annual parade of the Lord Mayor of the City of London. And by chance, my visit was on the day prior to the parade, when the company was making its preparations. I first met with David Bartle, the company's official archivist, who was able to explain the original purpose of livery companies and how they changed over time. Welcome to the fourth hall of the Haberdashers Company. We are one of 111 livery companies in the City of London today. This hall is located in West Smithfield, which is in a fact in a different place to where all our previous three halls were situated, which was Gresham Street, much nearer the Guildhall. 
Livery companies are really guilds, like those to be found elsewhere in the country and actually in Europe generally. We are really membership organisations that in past centuries used to look after the running of our trades in the City of London. We came into existence to support our members and regulate their trade in the city. Members were supported by arrangement of apprenticeships and provision of almshouses. The trade was regulated to ensure that only freemen of the company could trade in haberdashery goods in the city. The companies are arranged in an order of precedence and the first 12, which are some of the older companies, are known as the Great Twelve. The Great Twelve came about in 1515 when Henry VIII and the city decided to fix the order that had previous been, previously been fluid of the city livery companies. At that point, we ended up eighth in the list of precedents on the list. There were many guilds in the city and each wore their own colour clothing and gowns. And it's doing this that gave them the nickname of livery companies, the livery being a reference to the costumes. In the Middle Ages, the term worshipful simply meant to be respected. As in the past, judges used to be called your worship for the same reason. Thus, our company's very formal name is the Worshipful Company of Haberdashers. Now, before school qualifications existed, the way a young person learned to trade for their livelihood was by finding a master to provide a seven-year apprenticeship between the ages of 14 and 21 years. This was done through an appropriate, in trade, livery company. Patrimony began in the 17th century and it was a means to extend company membership numbers. It originally meant that a father could nominate his son to become a member, but today it means a parent of either gender can nominate a child to become a member. Now the Haberdashers Company has its origin in medieval times, in fact in the early 14th century. The company has its roots in what's called a fraternity, a group of men who lived in, in the same area of London and were doing the same kind of work, of course in our case the trade of haberdashery. Before we had any kind of hall we started meeting in a side chapel of the old St Paul's Cathedral dedicated to St Catherine of Alexandria. Now, St. Catherine is well known on Guy Fawkes Day for being commemorated by a Catherine wheel. And that's because she was supposed to have been martyred on such a wheel. In fact, finally dispatched by a sword. But she was a very popular saint in the Middle Ages. Members of the company were haberdashers by trade. They sold such things as ribbons, beads, purses, gloves, pins, caps and toys. Now, in fact, there were two types of trading haberdasher. Haberdashers who sold small wares, as I've just described, and also haberdashers who sold hats. Now, we have a little figurine in the hall taken from uh, mentioned in the Canterbury Tales in its prologue of a haberdasher and his wife, and alluding to the fact that they were in an early fraternity and talking about their grandeur. Now, this figurine represents the look of that haberdasher of that 14th century kind. In the year 1448, the company was granted a charter of what's called incorporation by Henry VI, which enabled it to hold land and to have its own hall in which to hold meetings. Our benefactors were company members who left money or land for charitable purposes. This could include schools, almshouses, or poor relief, which were to be continued by the company after the person's death. Acquiring land and receiving rents was a very good way of investing such charitable funds for the future. The first of three subsequent halls was built on the corner of Staining Lane and Maiden Lane, now called Gresham Street, in the City of London in 1459. Now the halls had various uses. It's where the master and wardens meet regularly to run the business of the company. It's where the clerk of the company and beadle will actually live. It's where apprentices were bound on their seven year apprenticeship to a master. These apprentices would sometimes gather in the hall as well for meetings, especially on the upper floor. 
So after something like uh, 300 years of the company pursuing the haberdashery trade uh, and its membership being uh, mainly employed in that, by the 17th century, the ability of the company to uh, successfully administer the trade was weakening because of imports and the growth of London, changes to the world of the cloth trade, and diversification of our members through the patrimony process, which allowed sons to follow their fathers into the haberdashery world, not necessarily doing that and pursuing other trades. So it was a slow decline, but through the 17th century, our link to the trade weakened. And at the same time, the company began to get more responsibilities with benefactions from its members towards um, educational and charitable purposes. So by the time we reached the 18th century, the trade was, was pretty weak in terms of how we were still involved in it. And the company was becoming more of a club. Many of the members who were there were coming because of their meetings with other members, the, their business prospects that they could form, talking, networking with other members, and their involvement in the civic city and becoming Lord Mayors and Sheriffs of the City of London. Uh, by the later 19th century, in fact, the companies generally, not just the haberdashers company, came under pressure to reform themselves and become more modern and not so like clubs and abandoning their charitable activities. And the haberdashers company responded to that by becoming much more focused on its charitable and educational work, which by the early 20th century had become the dominant activity the company pursued. A bit later, David will show us around Haberdashers Hall. But before that, let's learn a bit about the company's charitable and educational work and what part the company members play in that. Arabella, Susan and Angus from the Haberdashers Company will explain. So, through the 17th century, the City of London and Haberdashers prospered. They became really wealthy merchants, often trading overseas and building up large fortunes. But they were still really interested in their communities and with... And very much motivated by religious considerations. So some of them, when they died, left large sums of money to found charities to support both schools and almshouses. And it's from those, those original charities that some of our connections with schools around the country still exist to this day. There were three key benefactors. William Jones, who, founded, who set up schools in Monmouth. William Adams, who created a school in Shropshire and Robert Ask, who created schools in East London, in Hoxton. Those three key benefactors were, are still the origins of our four groups of schools today. So we now have the Monmouth Schools in, in South Wales. We have a Shropshire Academy Trust called West Midlands Academy Trust, which is composed of three schools, two state academies, one of which is a grammar school and a small independent school. And in London, we have two groups of schools, both based on that original foundation, but split off into an Academies, Academies Trust in South London and the Elstree Schools in North London. The historical connection between our schools has been back, based on those charitable foundations and maintained through governance structures. Even to this day, 50% of the governors at all our schools are members of the Haberdasher Company. More recently, it's been supplemented by our direct programme, the Haberdashers Advantage programme, which is aimed at empowering all young people to meet their full potential. Alongside the education programme of the company, the organisation also works with a lot of charities in the spaces surrounding our schools and our churches. The company has eight churches of which it's patron, and so we support their work through a small grant, and the work that we do that surrounds our schools in terms of our charitable endeavours acts as a kind of safety net. It complements the formal education of our schools, but also makes sure that those young people are looked after, that they can flourish and they can grow in their chosen vocation, in their chosen career. One of the really important things for the company is the time, the talent and the treasure of the membership. So we work really hard to ensure that not only do we give grants to the charities that we support, but we also give the time and the talent of our members, members who can offer huge value to those very small charities that we select in order that they can really flourish and support the work of the communities that surround the schools. As an example, a haberdasher might volunteer for a charity and really help them elevate the work that they do in order to reach more young people and to have greater and more significant impact. So the membership of the Haberdashers Company today 
does not comprise haberdashers. It comprises a broad mix of people from a diverse range of backgrounds, a diverse range of employment sectors, uh, a diverse range of experiences and expertise. So why become a haberdasher in the 21st century? Well, it's about giving back. It's about giving back to our schools, our charities, our churches, and indeed playing a part in the 21st century City of London. Now let David show us around Haberdasher's Hall. So, this is the fourth hall, and let's now take a little bit of a walk around uh, to see what we can find. It uh, might be helpful to tell you that uh, our first hall, which was a timber-framed building, was completely burned down and lost in the 1666 Great Fire of London. Then, as you see here, our second hall was built and lasted down to December 1940 when it was destroyed in the Blitz in World War II. Following that, this, you see, is our third hall, built in 1956 after the war, lasted until the 1990s when uh, it was actually demolished to make way for an office development. And so that's how we came to build the fourth hall, as we now see in West Smithfield. Let's uh, take a look now at some of the rooms that you can see in this present hall. This long room is called the reception gallery. It's panelled in oak wood and has a vaulted ceiling. Take a look at the large banner at the end of the room. Now this was used in the Diamond Jubilee River, River procession of the late Queen Elizabeth II. The banner features half a million golden buttons and was made by Anne Carrington. Also, take note of this rare English marquetry long case clock of 1700 by Jonathan Puller. This room is called the court room and it's actually used for meetings of the court of the company, which is the most important governing body. Uh, its decisions um, concern education and our charitable work. And so that's why it's a horseshoe shaped room to allow people to sit around to have the meeting. I'm afraid at the moment it's all set up as if it's a dining room because uh, tomorrow is the 11th of November and it's the Lord Mayor's show in the city. And we're having a breakfast in this building and so it's been accommodated, taken over, for helping with the breakfast. So it doesn't normally <laughs> look quite like this. The livery company generally has a court of assistance, as it's called, that it governs its business. It's headed by an annually elected uh, master of the company, and they have four wardens to assist in the case of the Haberdashers Company. Assistants are company members who are involved in school governorship, uh, charitable work, or other of our activities. Now this portrait of Thomas Aldersey is of our earliest educational benefactor. He founded his school in 1594 in the reign of Elizabeth I. The school was founded originally to be for 20 boys of Bunbury, a town in Cheshire, and they were to be educated in Christian teachings and basic numeracy, all of which was to enable them to get apprenticeships to start their working life. Normally Lord Mayors of London in modern times serve only for one year. But as you see in this portrait of Sir William Russell, it says at the bottom that he was Lord Mayor for two years. In fact, he was our first Lord Mayor of the city for 50 years. And because of the pandemic, an exception was made for him to be in office in 2020 and 2021. We're now in what's called the livery hall, the main room in this hall. Um, a livery hall is used for uh, large dinners, for uh, large meetings, and for many other events, business events. Now this room actually is set out like a medieval hall house, surrounded by oak. It has a solar end with a minstrel's gallery at the back. That's the high end where the important people would sit. And the opposite end is the service end. And in fact, uh, there's a way out to the kitchens there. The ceiling is vaulted, uh, just like a, a hall house of the past, with stainless steel rods really doing the job of oak beams. The blinds that you can see uh, against the windows have uh, recently been done, and they are showing the coats of arms of the great 12 livery companies. Uh, as I've told you earlier, we're number eight on that list. 
Right, here we are in the entrance courtyard of this fourth hall. Please take special note of the stained glass windows that you can see here. Originally, these were up in the minstrels gallery of the previous hall because they had natural light, but they've had to be put in illuminated cabinets to be seen here. Also, take a look at the William Pye made fountain, which was commissioned for the hall in the center of the courtyard. The three streams uh, represent the three ways uh, you can become a member of a livery company like this. The first, apprenticeship. Uh, the second, patrimony, by right of parent to child. And the last one, redemption, if the company wishes to invite you to uh, become a member. This area of the hall is known as the Orangery, and it's an enclosed side of the cloisters which surround the courtyard of the hall. These three cabinets that we can see here relate actually to the history of our previous halls. So our first hall was lost in the Great Fire of London in 1666. And after the Great Fire in the second hall, this cabinet was put in its entrance. And it reads at the top, the hall and tenements of the company of haberdashers being burnt in September 1666 were begun to be rebuilt in the year 1668 and the building carried on by the assistance of the worthy benefactors to whom names the sums by them given and subscribed are underwritten. And then this vellum document inside records the names of members of the company at the time who helped to pay for the building of the second hall. The one on the far side was put into the um, entrance together with the one I've just described of the third hall and uh, that was built after the Blitz. And then upon moving into this hall, this fourth um, hall, this cabinet was put in um, in the middle of the other two, um, showing a bit more grandeur to it than the others, with a St. Catherine uh, on the top and goats from the heraldry on the side. And people often ask, why is it more grand than the previous two? It's because I think we've decided we don't want to build any more halls if we have to. So this is where we're going to stop. This room is called the luncheon room, and it's the only room that we have in this hall that's been directly taken across from the previous post-war third hall. Uh, so it was obviously to be a reassurance to company members that at least something about the new hall reminded them of the previous one. Please note the portrait here of Deborah Knight. She was our master in 2012, and in fact she was the first master, lady master, in the Great Twelve Companies. The company's association with St. Catherine of Alexandria actually illustrates the strong Christian associations that the company has had in, in the past and, and through its history. It began from our meetings before we had a hall in the 14th century in a side chapel of the Old St. Paul's Cathedral which was dedicated to her and where members of our early fraternity met. Now here we can see uh, another representation of St. Catherine, this time from the 17th century, and she was the figurehead on our company barge. She's the only bit of that barge uh, that uh, remains. In fact, you can see a model of the barge here, and you can see on the deck of the barge is where she used to be set up. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short tour around the Haberdasher's Fourth Hall, and I hope that in the process, you've been able to learn a little bit more about the livery companies of the City of London, and in particular, the Worshipful Company of Haberdashers. As David mentioned earlier, the Haberdashers are one of 111 livery companies operating in the City of London. Each has its own history and characteristics. Some, such as the Haberdashers, had past benefactors who left them with great wealth that continues to fund charitable work today, while other livery companies have struggled financially. Their halls also vary greatly in size, age and magnificence. Not just the haberdashers, but most of the other ancient livery companies, such as the Mercers, the Drapers, Saddlers and others, moved away from their origins as trade guilds, as their members diversified their activities, and as the nature of trade in the City of London changed. But as the City of London evolved, new livery companies have been formed to represent the interests of their members. Their number has actually increased in recent decades as new livery companies have been formed, Amongst them, chartered accountants, world traders, marketeurs, constructors, information technologists, international bankers, and many others. It often seems that there are two sides to the City of London, the square mile. One side is that of modern business, such as finance, and the other side of old traditions. Perhaps livery companies have a foot in both. 
Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to like and subscribe. And don't forget, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And you can check my website for many articles about London's history. Bye for now.